And joining us now on the debate in Vancouver, British Columbia, Rudolf Kischer. He's a partner at the immigration law firm of Maynard Kischer Stoikovich. And with us here in studio, Phil Triadafilopoulos, professor of political science at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Karen Sun, executive director of the Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto chapter. Shalini Konanur, executive director of the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario. And Ruben Castambide Fernandez from OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. It's great to have all four of you here in the studio. And Rudy, it's good to meet you, I'll, albeit on the line from Vancouver. I want to ask what I think is a very simple, yet very tricky question right off the top. What does a new immigrant need to be successful when he or she arrives in Canada? Let's start to make a list. Shalini, you want to get us started? Go um, ahead. I think first and foremost what we need to talk about is supporting our new immigrants economically. And for, for my position, one of the hugest issues that we have is that um, the clients we see come with extremely high levels of skill. And they come to Canada and are landed in Canada, in fact, because of those skill levels. And then what they're told is, we're not going to recognize your skills. So a job appropriate to the skills they bring would be a good start. Absolutely. And the government, I think, has spoken a lot about making foreign accreditation easier. But to this point, we haven't seen that as a reality. And I'll give you a little bit of an example. My father immigrated to Canada in 1970 from India. He came here as an engineer from India. And within two weeks, he was hired at what was then called Ontario Hydro. Mm -hmm. And he worked there for 30 years till he retired. As an engineer? As an engineer, as a reliability engineer. In two engineer. weeks? In two weeks. That was the opportunity that was given to him and the recognition of his skills. In contrast, I work with two colleagues today who are foreign trained lawyers, one who actually has a master's in law from a Canadian school, who are both in the process of trying to accredit their legal skills and are two, three years into the process, their skills have still not been recognized, the cost has become prohibitive for them, and the emotional toll that it's taken on them has been quite dramatic. We hear this all the time. Okay, let's get some more ideas. Ruben, what would you say? What does a new immigrant need to be successful when he or she arrives in Canada? Well, from, from the perspective of schools and the experiences of uh, students who arrive into the Canadian school system, uh, one, of the, one of the key needs that students have is a recognition of the cultural richness that they bring, to the, that they bring to the, into the schools uh, and, a, and a real valuing of the differences that they bring. One of the things that students uh, who arrive from other countries encounter when they arrive to schools are lots of stereotypes about who they are, lots of narrow definitions about who they are, uh, and lots of already made expectations instead of a real sense that they are people, that they are full people with a rich cultural background that they can, that can really enhance their education uh, and so what they need is, a, is a, a school system and educators that are open to the richness that they bring with them. Educators and, and, and fellow students, I assume. Of course, well. of course, yes. absolutely. Okay. Rudy, what would you put on that list? I think I'd add education um, uh, and English. English being one of the most important factors. I think if you look at the Canadian immigration system, what we've seen is a, a shift away from uh, merely looking at uh, academic credentials and, and work experience and realizing that to transfer those skills to jobs in Canada, you really need to have uh, English ability which probably was a, a ma major asset in your father's favor, right? Because he probably had English coming from India. He did. No, he had absolute. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not for you. I'm saying for Shalini. He did. He had those skills. Um, and, but the truth is I, m most of the immigrants that we work with in the South Asian community who come here under that skilled worker program also do have those skills. So language has not primarily been an issue for those clients because part of being landed is to demonstrate that you can have those skills. Well, except so. that we've heard over and over this week that the, the skills you need, I don't know, Karen, if you want to speak this, but the, the skills you need to get in and the skills in English you need to actually get a job, there's quite a disparity right there. And that's one frustration we've heard over and over. Anyway, Karen, what would you put on the list? I would put all three of those things that uh, mm -hmm. the other panelists have just talked about. I think uh, in the Chinese community, English language skills is a big problem that, that uh, we do need to improve English language training for immigrants coming from China and English language training that will get them a professional level job, not basic English that's going to help them get their groceries and get around on the TTC, that we need like a, a higher level of English uh, proficiency uh, training for new immigrants. Um, I think a lot of the time we spend talking about poverty and how poverty is more prevalent in immigrant populations and that sort of thing, but the best way out of poverty 
poverty is to get a good job and to get a job that you have professional skills in. And there's lots of skilled immigrants coming into the country now. Most of them are only able to come into the country because of their skill level. Um, and certainly, um, touching on what Ruben was saying about um, bringing a cultural sort of perspective and, and different experiences that people have, I think um, it's important both in the school but also in the workplace that you can bring people uh, into a workplace that can give a different perspective, particularly as the world is globalizing and workplaces are globalizing, that it's actually a benefit to um, companies to have that diversity of perspective. Okay. Phil, what are you putting on the list besides everything you've heard so far? Um, willingness to suffer on the part of the immigrant, mm -hmm. a willingness to uh, uh, settle for second or third or fourth best for a period. Um, I bet that's not something they're going to hear from the Canada uh, Immigration well, Service. Well, no, and that's because we have a highly regulated uh, doorway. So our admission system is very well uh, structured, well, well structured, it's structured. Mm -hmm. But we have a sort of laissez-faire approach to integration, particularly economic integration, where we are just starting to begin to put measures in place. Now, I think there has been some uh, progress on this, uh, on this front. I, I was uh, at an event where Eric Hoskins, Dr. Eric Hoskins, was speaking on Ontario Ontario's... Ontario Immigration uh, uh, Minister. Correct. And uh, I was... Uh, pleased to hear that he was reporting on some progress, but I agree very much that there's a lot that needs to be done. We've started much too late, and we made, I think, the, the false assumption that if we really had a very sophisticated filter and could select out immigrants who we felt uh, possessed the human capital to make it, that they would make it. And we had very few tools for working with them in our labor markets, in our society. And I Ru think uh, I want to go to Rudy on a with a follow-up there, because this, these are your clients, I presume, we're talking about here, and I wonder how many of them are told when they first come to Canada, if you want to make it here, be prepared to suffer. I think uh, I'm very frank with my clients. Uh, if they're coming and they don't have a job offer in place or they're looking for a job, my advice is expect to take something uh, less than what you're used, for, used to. I think uh, Canadians sometimes can be very uh, parochial in their, their attitude towards uh, foreigners coming in. I've, I've had bankers coming from England that were you know, told, well, you don't know the Canadian banking system, as if they don't have banks in England. Um, and what I've found is that after six, six months of experience, sometimes, you know, salaries are doubled because they finally get their foot in the ground and people see what they can do. So there's definitely, uh, you know, I, I tell them they have to lower their expectation, get some Canadian experience behind them, and then things should look better after that. Shalini, we have heard this, again, over the series of the past week, that immigrants do come to this country with expectations that are off the charts. They think, I, I guess so many of them, too many of them, have been you know, given the wrong impression of what they can anticipate here. Do you see that? I do see that, and I, and I, don't, I don't see it as expectations. I see it as dreams. And wh what I see is that, um, and what I hear time and time again from my clients is that when our immigration officials are in foreign countries, the picture they paint of the opportunities in Canada are very different, actually, from the reality of what's here. So it's, it's a little bit disingenuous to say that the expectation is solely on the, on the hands of the immigrant, because that expectation was created by the publicity that we have put out in foreign countries. I mean, there are... Not, I don't want to say come recruiting, to come to Canada, it's the land of greener pastures, mm -hmm. come for the opportunities. And then, of course, these, these people apply, and oftentimes they wait seven, eight, nine years to land here, and they come here, and it's a very different story. Okay, Rubain? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important part of the story, is what is the narrative about Canada that is being presented to the world abroad, and the, the sort of notion of Canada as a place of multiculturalism where, where immigrants are welcome. Uh, and then confronting the reality of arriving and, and, and feeling that that is not appreciated. But I think it's very important when one talks about suffering, that suffering doesn't equal suffering doesn't equal suffering. Different immigrant groups encounter different levels of suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, if you come from a country and, uh, and you come with economic resources, it is not the same as arriving and being homeless uh, in the sure. streets of Toronto. Uh, and if you come from a country and the stereotypes that you encounter uh, for example, if you come from uh, East Europe or uh, different the stereotypes that you encounter are different, and they have different kinds of consequences. So the, this, this, this quote-unquote suffering that we are saying that immigrant, immigrants should expect, it's an equal to all sufferings. And there are gender differences, and there are class differences, and it's very important to understand the nuance of the experiences that immigrants have. But let me pick up on the suffering angle. Phil, let me go to you with this. I, 
Everybody at this table has heard the story of somebody who came over at the turn of the 20th century with 10 cents in their pocket and, you know, somehow managed to turn it into a very decent living and their children ended up going to university and all of that. And for those people who wonder, you know, today, all of the support services that are in place, none of which were available to people at the turn of the 20th century, they may be less sympathetic to today's immigrant than they would have been to their own ancestors. Is that fair? It's not fair, but it's, it's, it's premised on, on something real. Uh, my father didn't come at the turn of the 20th century. He came at the midpoint, but he had one of those stories. He came with, uh, you know, one change of clothes and a few of his favorite 45s is the story. From where? From Greece. Uh, he came as a skilled tradesman, as a carpenter, as an independently selected immigrant, as we were making that transition to selection away from racial preference. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that he was selected tells us something about the kinds of immigrants Canada was shopping for at the time. And those aren't the immigrants we're shopping for now. If we want carpenters, we'll get them through the temporary foreign worker program. So it's very hard to tell someone with an engineering degree or who has worked as a lawyer or who has done uh, very high level work as a professional that now you must pick up the hammer now you must pick up the hoe and do something uh, well beneath your, your, your standing. Now this isn't to say that um, we can't expect people to, suffering is it's, it's a, slight, it's a dramatic word, but it's very rare to <laughs> enter, I, I introduced it, yeah. uh, but to hit the ground running at, at precisely the same level, most people I think are, are expecting that that won't be the case, but it's a, a different uh, uh, thing to say, well put any, any thoughts of doing it all well at that level out of your mind and consider a service job or something well beneath your standards, your <laughs> intellect, your skills. Uh, that, that's where the disconnect is. I just want to do a note to the control room. Michael, I want to ditch the board at the top of page two and we're going to go to board number two. You do that too, eh? I'm glad we're on the same page here. Let's go straight to board number two if we can, which is in the middle of page two, because we're, we're sort of more onto this right now. This is the smell test by one of your colleagues, Phil, um, Philip Oriopoulos who says, in his study, why do skilled immigrants struggle in the labor market? Philip Oriopoulos, an economist at the University of Toronto, conducted an experiment where he sent various resumes out to potential employers and he found resumes with English names and Canadian education and experience got more interview callbacks than resumes with Chinese, Indian, or Pakistani <clears throat> names with foreign education and experience. One more point, Canadian applicants that differed only by name had substantially different callback rates. Those with English sounding names received interview requests 40% more often than applicants with Chinese, Indian, or Pakistani names. Okay, I guess we're not going to be too terribly surprised by that, Karen, right? I mean, this is the reality. We, we do not live in a colorblind, completely colorblind society. Um, but what do you want to do about that? I think that's a hard, um, that's a hard issue to tackle. I, I remember we uh, had a workshop once and this, this topic came up and we had little small group discussions and some of the people talked about this particular issue and some of them had decided that they were going to change their names um, to a more English Canadian sounding name, um, you know, to improve their chances of getting a job or at least getting an interview and, and there was a big debate about this because giving up your name is giving up a part of your identity. Um, but some of the more pragmatic folks in the room said, well, they can't pronounce your name anyway, so if they're getting your name wrong, you might as well just pick a new one. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a, it is an issue. And um, Let me ask Rudy about this. Do you ever counsel your clients to change their names because that might give them a faster avenue to getting a job? No, I've never, uh, you know, counseled someone to do that, but I, I know from my own experience with, with friends who have... Uh, married somebody with a, with a foreign sounding name uh, that they've gone back to change their uh, resume back to their maiden name perhaps because they found they got instantly more interviews. Hmm. So I, I think it's a reality. We're, not, we're definitely not a colorblind society. Um, but I, I think I want to go back a little bit to your point talking about uh, who needs help when they arrive. I, I think it's important to realize that you know when we're talking about helping people when they arrive, we've got different classes of immigrants that arrive in Canada. Um, we have refugees and people that come under a humanitarian category. And I, I, th I don't think Canada's policy is we're going to open the door and let you fall flat on your face. I, I think there we have a, an obligation to help. And then we have an economic class that arrives um, that I don't think uh, are, are, is expected uh, to receive that much help. And I think if you take a look at the, the system, the way the system has evolved today, there's been some dramatic changes over the last year and a half. 
that it's almost impossible now to, to, to come to Canada without a job offer. You almost have to, except for 29 occupations that are listed, and that, that, that list has now, it's gone from, there used to be over 1,000, it was down to 38, and about six months ago they reduced it to 29. It's almost impossible now to come to Canada without a job offer under the economic class. Hmm. Shalini, how about on this issue of change. changing your name in order to get a job or the fact that if your name sounds a little different from John Smith, you may have more trouble getting a job than, you, than you'd hoped. And see, that speaks to something that we tend not to talk about and there's a real discord that we see with our clients in terms of discrimination and um, the uh, rise in human rights claims, and uh, Ontario actually has set up a human rights legal support center that literally can't meet the capacity for the number of discrimination and employment claims that they're seeing. And uh, we, have, we have a very real issue with discrimination against our immigrant societies, against our racialized communities. And, in, and just to follow up on Rudy's point about supports, because I agree with him that when refugees, when people land on humanitarian and compassion applications, we should have supports for them. Interestingly enough, in Ontario, the federal government, uh, through Citizenship and Immigration Canada, provides a tremendous amount of funding for settlement. And in the last two months, has actually dramatically cut the funding for settlement agencies in Ontario, 14 agencies in the GTA. And what we hear is that that's going to increase next year. There's going to be even more cuts. So well, I, heard it's, I heard it's not so... It's, it's a cut to Ontario, but it's not a cut on the overall budget. They're just moving it to Western Canada. They're moving away from Ontario, which is an immigrant-rich province. Right. So but, the idea... But the top guys in the government are all from Western Canada. There we go, there right? There you go, so. okay. <laughs> Rudy's smirking because he's in Western Canada. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Phil, this is your colleague, um, Philip Oriopoulos, who did this study. And I, I wonder, do you know whether it's almost two years ago that it came out? Has anything been done to take action on this issue since then? A name change issue? I mean, not particularly. No. And when people repeat this CV study in France and in other uh, jurisdictions, they get the same results. So this isn't a, a Canadian problem per se. Um, I think the name change and the ease of pronouncing a name is one thing, but uh, we don't know whether that's what's driving employers not to make that phone call. Uh, and Phil Oriopoulos uh, uh, has been quite clear about not inferring. Um, a clear cause uh, mm -hmm. to the employers. So it could very well be um, just difficulty uh, uh, getting your tongue around a name, or it could be something less, uh, less benign. Well, it's interesting. A guy with a last name Triadophilopoulos didn't have trouble getting a job at the University yeah, of but, Toronto. But Phil uh, is uh, a name I picked up in grade two when I moved from an area with many Greek kids to an area with no Greek kids. And mm -hmm. as we were going around the room, I realized very quickly that my name wasn't going to fly. What it was, was it? It was Triandafilos. Triandafilos, Triandafilopoulos. Try that one. Nope. Uh, 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 and <laughs> it, it settled on a fellow named Phil Grove, who's still one of my closest friends. And I thought, Phil, Triandafilos, it, it might fly. Interesting. I wonder if Ruben Gastambide Fernandez <laughs> has ever had trouble with that hyphenated name getting I've a had, job. I mean, I've had many troubles with. Really? Uh, I've had many troubles with human resources offices, which really? is why I ended up using a hyphen actually. But I actually wanted to uh, add another layer to that, which is you know, sociolinguists who study the interview process have demonstrated that it isn't just about you, whether your name gets you in. It's that once you get in, if you don't have the, the linguistic capacity to engage in something we call an interview, that is a very culturally specific engagement, mm -hmm. you are not likely to get the job. And so regardless of your credentials, you have to take into account the actual interaction that happens. We actually, I actually have a colleague at, at OIC who has studied interviews uh, across, across uh, uh, specifically with, with, with immigrants. Um, and it does play a key role that if, once you're in the interview, if you're not able to deliver the kind of cultural specific way of doing an interview and the language, you're li not likely to get a job. I wonder if this is that big a thing. And I only raise it because, you know, Bernie Schwartz could never have been a Hollywood heartthrob, but he changed his name to Tony Curtis and he could. You know, Nathaniel Birnbaum doesn't sound like a funny guy, but you change it to George Burns and suddenly, you know, he's the voice of God. People have been changing their names for a long time, Karen, and I don't know, is that just the reality of the marketplace? I don't know. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, you know, I was born and raised in, in Toronto and, and uh, my so parents are So you're always from, Karen's son? My, my parents are from Hong Kong and now I'm working in an office where a lot of, the, a lot of my staff and a lot of my volunteers are Mandarin speakers from mainland China and they have names that are pinyin that I struggle with. 
and uh, many of them have chosen, while they keep their, their real name for government documents and whatnot, they do have an, an English name that they use just because it's too much trouble to constantly correct people with their name pronunciation, particularly with um, Chinese languages because it is a tonal language that even if you kind of get it right in English, you're not going to get the tones right because so like the, the chances of getting their name wrong are so astronomically high <laughs> that a lot of them do just choose to, to go with an English nickname. Okay, let me pick up on uh, where Sh uh, Shalini took us a few moments ago and that was this issue of settlement supports from the various governments. Yes, the federal government has changed. Let's use the neutral term here. You will say cut back and that's fine uh, on what they're doing in the province of Ontario. But Rudy, I want to start with you. Um, understanding where your clients are coming from, do you think that the amount that both federal and provincial governments our funding for settlement services nowadays is adequate to the task. What's your view? Well, in, in BC, we're, we're, we're lucky here because the provincial government stepped in and uh, closed the gap. So where the Fed said they were cutting funding, uh, the BC provincial government decided to top that up. So we've seen no declining funding here. Um, do I think the, the funding is adequate? I mean, I think in some cases there, there could always be more done, especially in the way of, uh, of ESL services, where a lot of the schools are actually struggling with providing adequate uh, ESL services for new immigrants. Shalini, I know your view on this. They're getting the money in Western Canada that you think you need here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think of it that way. I think we all need those services. And um, I think if you look at Ontario in particular, there's no doubt that um, there's a huge influx of immigrants coming into the province. And um, at a time where we're encouraging that immigration, why would you cut settlement services? That would only impede What's the number? The is, support. It, is it 40% of all new immigrants to Canada 40 come to, to Toronto? 40% to 50% start in Toronto. Start in Toronto. And they Toronto. obviously move to different places. Yeah. Um, but I agree with Rudy. Um, the, the agencies that we've seen simply don't have the capacity right now to meet the needs of the communities that are coming through their doors. So no, there's not enough funding for those services. Let me hear and then Karen on this as well. Yeah, I wanted to return to the issue of employment because what we found really interesting, that this actually echoed, uh, sort of reverberated in the interviews that we did with the students, is that students felt that one of the stereotypes that people had of them is that simply because they speak Spanish or were from Latin America, that they want to go into service jobs, that they were going to be maids, that they were going to be garden keepers, uh, that they were going to be there to enter those service jobs. And this had a huge influence in whether they were tracked into university courses or whether they were in tracked into applied courses. And we know from the board that there's a, there's a very big uh, relationship between the, whether the students are enrolled in applied courses or university courses and what they end up doing. And because the students often don't have the resources to figure out to navigate that system, they rely on guidance counselors and on teachers to make those decisions for them. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because on the one hand, there's this sort of economic need, you know, Part of what brings, it, part of why Canada needs immigrants is because it needs immigrants to, to take those jobs, mm -hmm. right? To be people cleaning bathrooms, to be. And so it, rather than thinking about immigrants who arrive, for example, from Latin America, as saying, okay, what can they do? And, and given the full range of, of possibilities, they can be doctors, they can be lawyers, as well as garden keepers. The assumption is they're all going to be garden keepers and they're all going to be cleaners. And that translates, that translates into the experiences mm -hmm. of students in schools. And many of the students didn't come to Canada with a job because they had the children of the people who came you know, mm -hmm. for the job. So they haven't, their future hasn't been laid out for them. But the school already receives them with a set of expectations about what jobs they're supposed to, to, to assume that very much have to do with the economic needs of the, of the nation exactly. and the expectations uh, upon, put upon them. Karen, how are we doing on settlement services, various government levels? Um, I mean, I, I think I agree with Shalini that we need more supports overall. I think it was, it, was terrible what like the way those cuts happened this year that there was an announcement that you know there are going to be cuts there is no transition for you know where are those clients going to go but I think also like beyond just talking about dollars and cents I think there should be more flexibility in how those programs are run so that local organizations that are running those programs have more flexibility in tailoring programs to the communities that they're serving. And I don't think that flexibility is there right now. Phil, we know that philosophically this is a federal government that believes philosophically that, this, that the federal government should be doing less as opposed to more. So are provinces having to step into the breach across the country to improve their settlement services as the feds back out? 
Well, we have a, a very disparate situation across the Federation where uh, some provinces have uh, assumed virtually all power over settlement, organizing and, and providing settlement services through third sector parties in Manitoba and BC. That's the model. Ontario uh, is entering into negotiations with Ottawa uh, to renegotiate its bilateral agreement on settlement, uh, which includes funding levels and the nature of the responsibility. It's unlikely that it will receive something like a BC uh, devolution or whether it even wants it. It's not clear to me. Um, so responsibility is, is not hard to pin, uh, who's responsible and who's accountable. Um, the federal government provides some language services, Ontario government provides some language services. Ontario government standards for who gets to access those services are different from the federal government's uh, uh, standards as to who can access those services. We have a melange and uh, it's very hard to say who precisely is responsible, who should be held accountable, and that's mm. problematic. Rudy, is the system so problematic right now that we don't know who's doing what, we don't know who's responsible for what, would it be better if all of the responsibility fell to either one level of government or the other? Well, I, I think, uh, as Phil mentioned, we're lucky here in BC that the, the provinces have taken over that primary role. Um, I think that there's some advantage to that, to taking over that direction. Um, what I find shocking about this government is, is the timing of the cuts. I mean, the cuts were made on December, I think, 23rd, just, mm -hmm. be just before Christmas. Um, the announcement was made to, to make sure that it was hushed up. Um, and secondly, I, I, th I think uh, if you look at the time when we're in an economic downturn, we're starting to recover, uh, jobs are hard to find. Uh, I don't think that's a time when you pull away these services and make these cuts uh, at that time because that's when people need them the most. Um, you know, we saw them extend uh, uh, EI benefits, etc. cetera, but uh, you know, they're taking away for the, from the newcomers that need them the most, which I think is inappropriate. Okay, we've got less than 10 minutes to go here and I want to put one more issue on the table for your consideration. And of course, we've left the most controversial for the end. <laughs> and that is the cultural values that all of our different immigrant groups bring to the country and what we think of that. Um, this got a little bit of play, McLean's Magazine's article <laughs> saying our universities are too Asian, quote unquote. Uh, the notion that um, so-called tiger moms or tiger parents um, is out there and available for debate. Here's what Dan Gardner wrote in the National Post as a result of this. He said, the story is the same everywhere. Name a country and chances are you will find a Chinese immigrant community which values education, demands hard work, sacrifices for tomorrow, and succeeds. Okay, let's get into this. Is Dan Gardner right? Is it about the values that you also bring into the country with you that helps figure out what percentage, I don't know what, 50%, 75% determine whether you're going to be successful. Okay, Ruben, go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, for <laughs> passing me with that, that hot potato. Uh, obviously, people don't come to any country as a tabula rasa. They arrive with cultural experiences, cultural values. Um, it is true also that there are, there are differences that either those cultural values resonate well with the culture into which they're coming or which they don't. It's a fallacy to think that people arrive into Canada without a commitment to education, without a commitment to hard work. It takes an enormous amount of work to migrate into any country from any other country. So to think that people arrive thinking that they're going to have it easy or not going to be ready to sacrifice, it's a fallacy because they've already sacrificed a lot. They've already put a lot of work to be able to do this. Um, but they also, once, once they come, they encounter a set of circumstances that are not necessarily what they expected uh, and that are not necessarily consistent, necess that, that doesn't have to do so much with whether it's consistent with their values, whether they value hard work or value uh, education, but that the expectations from both sides sometimes just mismatch, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whether it is your expectations about schooling or expectations about parents or expectations about work or expectations about children. It isn't so much about values, right. it's about the structures. Well, I'm going to follow up on that because, Phil, I don't have to tell you, there is a perception out there, there are stereotypes out there that suggest Asian parents value hard work, sacrifice, you know, the whole tiger mom syndrome, more than, say, Portuguese parents or Spanish parents or black parents. That's out there. Is it accurate? I think any reductionist argument should be looked at with suspicion. If we argue that it's the culture that is leading to the outcome, we're making a, a big mistake because if we go far, not too far back, but what were people saying about Chinese immigrants at the turn of the 20th century? 
you know, precisely uh, the opposite, that they could not integrate. They were, they were culturally and biologically incapable of becoming Canadian, and suddenly they're model immigrants uh, uh, because of their culture. That should send up a red flag and say, well, this, this culture argument is, is too simple. It's not to deny that culture informs the way we think about uh, how we get along in the world, but uh, to reduce a success and failure to a culture argument, I don't like that. Karen, where are you on that? I thought it was really pro a really problematic article. Um, and the I McLean's piece? The McLean's piece and the Dan Gardner piece. Uh. Um, I felt that he was confusing culture and race in a really problematic kind of way, and I, I just, I, I didn't like his argument. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say so about I that. I don't want I you to say anything. I don't that. know what you think. You, you didn't like the piece. Okay, Shalini, yeah. what do you think? I agree completely with Phil. Um, I think this is this phenomenon of trying to tie people to cultural values just leads to division and leads to a stereotyping of communities, which is then not picked up in a positive way, but actually picked up in a negative way to then paint those communities and put back those communities into corners into things that they're not. And we see that every day with our different South Asian communities. We know how they're portrayed in the media and how they have been portrayed in the media for the past two, three, four, five, ten years. And those are all based on stereotypes based on quote unquote culture, which in and of itself is a term that is so broad that it's even difficult, uh, like Ruben had pointed out, to even define what that is. Values, race, culture. Of course, everyone's culture impacts how they're going to succeed, how they're going to live their lives. That's a given. But is that the determinant factor in whether an immigrant is successful in this country? No, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, I, I'm tempted to follow up here because everybody's giving, of course, the, the right answer. Mm -hmm. You're saying culture is a factor. You're saying culture is a huge part of who we are, of how we self-identify. But it's not determinant in you know, realizing our potential here. You know, either, either it's a huge deal, it's a huge factor, it's, you know, it's who we are, and therefore it helps determine how well we do here, or are we kidding ourselves? I agree with you. It's a factor, but it's one of several that we've talked about tonight, right? Class is a huge factor. Economics is a huge factor. Opportunity, what your name might be, is apparently a huge factor. <laughs> so right? it's on the list. So it, it is on the list, and but I want to just say that I think when you go down this road, you lead to stereotyping and you lead to division and you lead to pitting communities against each other, which really doesn't benefit any Canadian. Rudy, let me hear you on this one. Well, I don't think it's helpful from uh, looking at an immigration policy debate to, to delve into it. I mean, I, I think it's a factor. Is it a uh, important factor? I don't think so. I think the individuals we see coming to Canada, they've got to get up and go. I mean, they've decided somehow whether it's to sit on a boat for a month that looks like it's about to sink or to get on a plane and try and get a job here and come over here and interview and, and go through a, a long bureaucratic process to arrive. They've, they've striven for that, uh, you know, and I don't think that uh, taking a look at culture, how much does it play whether they're going to be successful immigrants? I think it's more the other factors that were mentioned, their economic background, their English ability, um, their education, and I think those are the important factors. And, and that's the way, if we're shaping an immigration policy, I think we have to look at the individuals and look at what are they bringing to the table? What's their education like? What, are, what, are, what is their English ability like? What is their work experience? And those are the things we have to look at. Let me hear from Rubain and then from Karen. Yeah, I wanted to uh, pick up on his point because I think it's really important to kind of, in a way, begin to think about culture slightly different. Uh, rather than thinking about culture as people something bring, which implies also that there's a culture already in place, right, that, that they're supposed to uh, enter. If we thought about culture in terms of what is it that we all bring to the table and the culture as something that is being actually made in the process, if we think about, for example, the notion of multiculturalism as an evolving idea, as something that we do every day as we enter our lives, then, then we, we, we have to reject the stereotype, right? So if by default we assume that when we walk into a classroom, and I'll use the classroom because that's what I'm most familiar with, that we, we cannot predict what's going to happen in that classroom by virtue of what we think somebody looks like. No, but I bet you can predict, and I bet, you, I bet everybody does this. I mean, they go through the class, they see who the Portuguese kids is, and they make assumptions about how involved the Portuguese right. parents are in that they kid's... They make assumptions, that's right. About that kid's But those assumptions habits. have nothing to do with the, the culture of those people or their value of those people. They have to do with... with uh, an expectation and in a way a sort of need that the school is supposed to provide 
you know, people who are good citizens and who enter these, these places in an economic structure that already exists, which includes service workers. So these structures are already operating in the expectations that people have. So if instead of having that as a presumption, we entered the classroom with a sense of possibility and said, let's, you know, as he was saying, let's think about what is it that people bring, what are the strengths, you know, what is it that they can provide for the construction of a multicultural space? Gotcha. Then we can have a different conversation. Karen, come on in here. Um, I think uh, I agree a lot with what Ruben just said around cultures and how we create cultures, that cultures aren't just kind of like, it's one thing and this is what you are. And, and again, picking up on the issue of stereotypes, um, you know, we shouldn't put people in boxes like you are this culture, you are this stereotype, and, and even so-called positive stereotypes of model minorities, like all Chinese people are, are all Chinese immigrants are successful. Um, well, certainly they struggle and they're not all successful. Um, and, and you know, a lot of them decide to go back because they were more successful back there than they are here. Um, so I think a lot of these stereotypes, you know, we have to question uh, where they come from and whether or not they're true. And, and what that means as far as um, the kinds of supports that we give to people or how we target our supports to different ethnic groups. Um, and, and what barriers are people actually struggling with as they go through their immigration process? Phil, let me give you the last 20 seconds. Intermarriage, do you think that's a sign of success, that the assimilation is all complete? <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, sociologists for a long time, or they used to claim that was one of the milestones. I think it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's an outcome of a society where people are living beside one another and they fall in love. My, thesis advisor used to go beyond that and <laughs> use more colorful language. <laughs> but but uh, is it a mark of success? I don't know. It's a mark of change. And uh, we'll leave the evaluation to the sociologist. I'm a political scientist. Gotcha. From the political scientist whose real name is? Triandafilos Triandafilopoulos. Triandafilos Triandafilopoulos. Oh Bravo. my goodness. Okay. Okay. That was a mouthful. Thank you everybody very much for participating today. Uh, starting with Rudy Kisher in Vancouver, the immigration lawyer. Rudy, thanks for being on the line with for us uh, out on the left coast. Uh, back here in studio, you, Karen Sun from the Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto Chapter, Shalini Konanur, South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario. I'm not going to say your old name, I'm saying your new name now. Phil Trianofilopoulos, University of Toronto, Ruben Gastambide Fernandez at OISI. Thanks everybody for coming in tonight. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.